And most of the time they're just asking, what's your name, welcome, where are you welcome from? Welcome to Lazor, welcome. <laughs> they just you ask, good what's man, your name? good man, good <laughs> man. Very nice man, you are Rambo man. Rambo. Rambo. Are, this, is what, this is reality. Is Egypt safe to travel in? It's the number one question I got before coming here. Now, I'm shooting this introduction here at the market in Luxor because this is my number one tip. This is the number one thing I've learned. I've learned about Egypt and traveling in Egypt is it is safe relatively with a few asterisk, asterisks, asterisk, what's plural for asterisks, astri. Anyway, it is relatively safe, but with a few caveats. Number one is they are the greatest salesmen of all salesmen. They're always gonna sell you something. This is all aspects of traveling around Egypt, especially in the locations where there is a ton of tourism. <laughs> They asked me for a tip going through security. They said, special treatment for you. You don't have to take your shoes off. This is pre-security before you even get into the airport. They said, special treatment for you. You don't have to take your shoes off. Nobody was taking their shoes off. And he said, can I have a tip? Can I have a tip for not taking your shoes off? <laughs> Egyptians. <laughs> I love it. All right, let me step away here for a second from the crowds and try to speak to you with the microphone on. Everything I've mentioned to this point is what I would call the direct approach. Really people just trying to feed their families and it's completely understandable to some extent. Now it's the second method of people hustling here in Egypt that really turns people off from visiting and that's a more deceitful way to get money from tourists and, and try to trick them into tips. And I watched a ton of scammers in Egypt videos and uh, avoid this guy videos or the truth about Egypt videos and really so many of the things that they talk about in these videos will be avoided by seasoned travelers. Yes, they're charging you tourist prices in the most tourist location on earth, the pyramids of Giza. Yes, it is a tourist trap. There's tons of people trying to sell you stuff. It doesn't have to be that dramatic, but I understand the drama and the chaos and the fear is what sparks views. And we'll talk about YouTube stuff later on when I talk about filming and police. But truthfully, a lot of these things come down to price negotiation. And also a huge tip I can give you is never trust anyone who approaches you first. If someone approaches you and wants to hand you something or give you a gift or put something on your head or, or do anything with you or give you directions, do not trust them. This is basic traveler awareness and Egypt will force you to learn this very quickly. And to get more specific, there are basically two types of scammers at the Great Pyramids. The first is those people that will try to get you to do a horse ride or a camel ride and then take you all around and then charge you a price afterwards. So to avoid this, simply tell them what price you're willing to pay ahead of time. The second type of scammer that's gonna be at the pyramids is those that will try to tell you what direction to go in or follow me, you're going the wrong way, you're going out of bounds. And these people could be actually registered tour guides or officials or security guards, but do not believe them. You say, I'm all good, I'm gonna go my own way because eventually they're gonna ask you for a tip. They will probably follow you around, keep telling you that you're not going in the right direction and you just have to avoid them. And if you do have an issue with someone at the pyramids or any historical site or anywhere across Egypt, tell them that you're gonna contact the tourism police and see what they do. They're all very scared of the tourism police. If you're with a guide, none of this stuff happens. They may come up to you, people may come up to you and ask you for something or, or tell you something and a guide will immediately shut it down. Unless you're looking for souvenirs and then a guide might direct you to a, a place or, or someone that he knows, he gets a commission from it and that's something to be aware of as well. What a lot of places will do and tour guides will do is they'll bring you to places to show you demonstrations, you know, perfume, ornaments, whatever it may be. They'll say it's just a demonstration, you don't have to worry about something, and then they'll sell you on it later. So for example, we're at an alabaster factory right now. It's basically a giant store selling all these little trinkets where you can get all over the place. I need the people to come again. Come in Egypt, to visit Egypt, yeah? Come here, to yeah, come here. We need the people to come in. Everything here is very safe and very beautiful. Bring your money. Yeah. <laughs> just made it inside the perfume palace. Look at these things. 
Sheesh. For me, you look a guide. Okay. For the perfume? Yes. Yeah. Take us on a sensory adventure. It's our crew. And this is where they're going to try to sell us some stuff. So it's really us versus them to see if we can hold off, hold our money. <laughs> but if you have a good guide, a reputable guide, they'll immediately say, okay, sorry, we'll keep going. If you tell them that you're not interested. For me, I avoid a ton of this headache because one, I never buy souvenirs when I'm traveling. It's, I just don't want the extra baggage. And two, especially at the pyramids, I didn't do any of the animal rides, the camel rides, the horse, the donkey rides, because I just didn't like the way the animals were treated. So it's not something that I'm going to support personally. And the only time I really ran into this uh, kind of d this bait and switch, kind of this deceitful way of selling that is prominent here in Egypt is on our trip to Siwa. And we had a local connection and we had a tour that we ended up paying a lot more money than we thought for, the, the desert tour. Again, we, we did a ton of stuff with this guy. He gave us one price at the beginning of the day. The end of the day, he said we took longer than expected, which throughout the time we were together, he was saying, oh, no, no, it's fine. We can do whatever you want. We can do whatever you want. And then at the end of it, he's like, oh, we took a lot longer than expected. I'm gonna charge you more hours. And then also the hotel that we stayed at, they gave us one price at the beginning and then end up paying another price at the end. You really have to communicate with the people that you're with about the final price because they will try to avoid the conversation or be like, oh, don't worry about it. We'll figure it out later. That's a huge thing for Egyptian scammers to do. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. Come over here, come over here. We'll do this now. And you say, how much? And I'll say, oh, no, no, we'll figure it out later. Don't worry about it. And that's the same thing what happened to us in Siwa. So that was a bit frustrating. Now, granted, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt with the Siwa Oasis experience because that was on me too for a lack of communication. So make sure you communicate prices at every step along the way. And you have to be as assertive as other people are trying to get your money. And that is a, a tough thing for a lot of people. But when you're traveling, you have to be confident and assertive and you have to be protective of your wallet. Otherwise, in Egypt, you can really be taken advantage of. Now, based on all the stories that I've heard and videos that I've seen, we went into this trip knowing that this type of stuff was going to happen. So we were extra alert from start to finish. So if you go into it with the attitude that I need to be aware of everything, it will really change your perspective. And you'll just say no, you'll let it you know, roll off your shoulder it won't be a problem for you. Honestly, we treated it like a game at one point. It was just fun to hear all the people trying to sell us stuff and other people trying to get us to go down to different places. Oh, no, no, you wanna go this way, check out this shop. And we'd even walk with some people and just joke and talk with them. <laughs> but truthfully, we went in with a really good attitude. But I do have to say, Tyler's here with me as well. They are very, very playful. <laughs> and they're very good. So even if you don't want to buy anything or you, you know, you're not buying what they're selling. And you find someone he's coming And very, very good looking. Thank you. Very good looking bro. people. <laughs> they're very playful. So even if you're not buying something, you can still be playful, you can talk to them. But they're all gonna say something. No matter what. So no hustle in here though. No hustle here. You walk around camera or not, you're gonna be heckled. Also, side note, interjection here. When dealing with transportation here in Egypt, number one, you wanna take Ubers pretty much everywhere. This is mostly in the bigger cities. So in Cairo, take an Uber everywhere and it's very, very cheap. One thing for me that I'm always anxious about if I can jump in here from the airport, coming back from Luxor to Cairo, is how do I get to my location from the airport? I don't know why, but it's something I'm always super anxious about. So for this, in Cairo, it's very easy. They have Uber here. It's cheap, it's safe, and it's a great idea. So you just order it up once you get your baggage claim, which is right through there. And then you come outside, which is right through there. So you go directly across from arrivals. You go across the street, past all the taxi guys, down the stairs into the parking lot. And there is our Uber. There's gonna be a lot of taxi people asking you for stuff, but just keep going and you'll reach your Uber. That's how you get out of the airport in an Uber here in Cairo. In regards to taxis, that's a different story. They have very interesting negotiation tactics. Basically, they'll give you a very high price and then they'll cut it down. For example, we're here in downtown Luxor and he started at 10 US dollars. Then we said, no, we'll do 40 total uh, Egyptian pounds. And he said, okay. 
And if he doesn't take that, immediately just walk away right away. And then they're like, wait, 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 hold on. Okay, we'll do it. So big time negotiation. There's big gaps in where they start and where they'll end up. So keep that in mind. And in regards to public buses or tour buses, we honestly haven't taken them around much because they take a long time. We did do a horse and carriage ride at one of the temples, but make sure you predetermine your rate before you leave. No matter what you do, no matter where you are in the world, make sure you predetermine your transportation fee before you leave. That's transportation here in Egypt. But honestly, the time I felt most unsafe here in Egypt is actually driving in a car. <laughs> the transportation, the, the drivers here are nuts. The traffic, they weave in and out, they don't respect the lines, it's wild. So for me, that's where I feel the most at risk is in a car, because they are just wild, especially in Cairo. Just drive. In Cairo, and uh, our car broke down on the side of the highway trying to get to our hotel. Tough start. As an American traveling in Egypt, how was your experience? Do you think it was safe? Would you recommend it? Yes, I'd recommend it. And what was your experience like? It was great. Uh, found some good local food. Traffic's a little hectic. Found a nice little spot to eat. Got hit by a car leaving from there, crossing the sidewalk. That was where in Cairo, right? It was in Cairo by the Egyptian Museum. <laughs> and you're okay? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Tyler's off talking to the guide. Let's talk money real quick while well, they're not paying attention. First of all, is Egypt a cheap or expensive place to travel? And I would say generally, very generally speaking, if you don't get ripped off, it is a very inexpensive place to travel overall. The flight is obviously your biggest expense that costs us about $1,000 each to get here, flying 24 to 30 hours. Second, your next biggest expense is going to be your hotels. And for our first night stay, first three nights actually, we stayed at that Pyramids Hotel right in Giza, and it was called the Guardian Guest House. Highly recommend it. And that was like 40 US dollars a night, which was perfect for what we needed. Then the nicer end of hotels, we stayed at the Hilton in Luxor, which was beautiful. And that was about $108 a night, which is an incredible steal. And I highly recommend it if you want a taste of the nicer things along the Nile River. And on top of that, you have food and the food costs were about from $3 to $8 a meal. Very inexpensive, especially when you're going out with locals, they'll set you up with the right prices in the right places if you go with the right people. And on top of that, true Egyptian friends, as you've seen from a couple of these episodes, they won't let you pay at all. True Egyptian hospitality, which a lot of YouTubers don't get a chance to see and a lot of people traveling there don't get a chance to see. A true Egyptian friend won't even let you touch the bill. Sorry. Okay. I'm gonna pay tomorrow. Okay? Tomorrow. tomorrow. I gotta get You can finish all your all right, money tomorrow, okay? Whatever money we have tomorrow, we're spending it no matter what. Okay, but <laughs> <laughs> Now, in regards to tipping, let me make sure they're not coming. In regards to tipping, this is the most interesting aspect of traveling in Egypt. Number one, you have these small little tips that you give off to people for helping you in certain locations. So if you go around with 20 Egyptian pounds, everybody, if you, anybody's bothering you about people want to help you out with stuff, just hand over 20, which is about a dollar, a little dollar and a little change. So we even 20 if you give them five pounds and give them five pounds. Five or ten pounds. Give them a few pounds, so keep small change on you. Give out a few pounds. People helping you with parking, people helping in the pyramids outside of, of food places, so that's another thing. Now, you can easily say no to these people, but we have found that it's just as easy to give them a five, a 10, or a 20 Egyptian pound if they help us with directions or there's the parking guys, uh, these little people that are just hustling to you know, make ends meet, small amount of money, no problem, we'll give it over, but you can always say no to that. Tipping in general, I give about 600 Egyptian pounds per day for a full day guide along the cruise and other places that we've had. And then I'll give about 100 to 200 Egyptian pounds to drivers. Now that varies a little bit. 
I'll give a little bit more if they're gonna be on camera a lot. If I'm asking them a ton of questions and I'm filming them for their answers, I will give them a little bit more, up to 800 Egyptian pounds. And this is a pretty good price. So that's about, what, 32 to 40 US dollars. So a nice, nice tip. And you could do anything from, you know, 200 to 400 to 600. We tip a lot more because the guys are on camera and we're asking usually a lot more. Now there has been a couple of times where we don't really use the guide much at all. In those circumstances, I'll go maybe two to 400 Egyptian pounds. So it really depends on you, how much work and effort they put into it. Now, definitely the most expensive portion of our trips were one, the Nile River cruise and two, the trip to Siwa Oasis. And we did have a local connection. Uh, we did a rental car. We also gassed for nine hours each way of driving and then tour through the desert. Uh, he was with us all day, but ended up charging a, a little bit over 200 US dollars, which is a pretty high amount. Again, we were filming, we set up the dinner, so we were happy to pay a little bit more. Um, again, there was a confusion with price, which I explained, but in general, we were happy paying a little bit more if we would have known up front. And also the same as I've talked about with the hotel in Siwa, but still it was about 300 US dollars for three people for two nights. So really not bad. It's just, you want to know prices up front. You know, that's the biggest thing. And I'm going to reiterate that in this video, understand prices on every single little aspect of your trip before you do anything overall inexpensive. All right, let's change gears for a second and talk about one of the most asked questions, and that is filming and the police. Now, let's just call it what it is. Egypt is notorious for being a very difficult place to film. So many YouTubers have had nightmares filming here, and they express their concern all across the internet. And I understand it can be very disheartening when you're trying to film and, and create content and have all these obstacles coming your way. And to be even more real, based on all your guys' comments and the message you left across Instagram and YouTube, I know that Sonny from Best Damn Food Review Show was filming and uploading videos at around the same time as I was. And so I did go back and watch his series. And now I don't know Sonny uh, personally, we're just friends of friends. and. Upon watching his videos, I want to speak on it because one, we'll just dive right into it. One, it seems like Sonny has a much bigger production team than I do. It is just Tyler and myself, and we came with very limited gear because of the knowledge that we have received from other people. So we brought only two cameras, his and mine. We brought two lenses for each camera. We did not bring tripods, and we definitely did not bring drones. Drones are a no-no. So what I did was, you do see some drone footage in these episodes. I hired a local guy, Salim, that you saw from Siwa, and he helped us drone a ton of different places. And on top of that, one big thing, we got rid of our microphones, which I have on right now because I'm in a little lot incognito, but no microphones. Those are the number one red flag for officials in archaeological sites, the pyramids, and the streets, everywhere. So. As you can tell from the footage, if you're listening closely, there's a lot of additional noise in these episodes. Let me explain very quickly why. So in 2011, there was a massive revolution in Egypt and they're very concerned about terrorism because of the problems that they've had. So between political and social issues and fear of terrorism, they really are concerned about what people film in the country, what they record and what they showcase. So that's why they're so scared or, or on edge about filming in the country. And on top of that, it goes with a lot of um, corruption and issues with police and things like that, that they don't want you to see the whole story. So that's why a lot of people have trouble filming here. Now there was one instance which was a little bit tricky. We ran into a couple of security guards while we were walking around Old Town the day of street food with Bisu and Kareem. And the security guards wanted to see the footage or the photos on our cameras. And Bisu and Kareem immediately walked up to him, started talking to him, explaining that we were American tourists just taking photos. and. A very interesting aspect that gave me a little peek into the, the Egyptian culture 
is that on all Egyptian licenses, they have their career listed right on there. And Bisu by trade is an engineer and that garnered a bit of respect and it had more credibility. So these security guards immediately backed down, let us through and said, you guys have a good day. I just had to make sure I had my microphone away and we were good to go. Again, that's just a big shout out to the people we were with and says a lot about the class systems and structures. We got a little peek into that based on this scenario. And I mean, unfortunately it's like this a lot of places. It's who you know, it's, it's who you're with. And I've heard from some other Egyptian friends that don't have this same type of credentials and they get harassed, they, they get in trouble and it makes it very difficult for them to go out and film or take photographs. And the same thing with, you know, any different YouTubers that have tried this as well. If, without the right credits, without the right credentials, you can get in some trouble. I know he had a very tough time with his production person that he brought in, his fixer, his local fixer, and that sucks because when you don't have a good local connection, and we've, we've seen that before, then everything goes wrong. And truthfully, what made this experience so amazing for us is that we had the best local connections. Now, I will say, we do film a little bit different. We run and gun, we just travel around and try to experience the place and film it as we go. And I know some creators will do the reverse. They will go to a place to film and set up scenes and things like that so i think that helps us a lot sometimes we just captured stuff with iphones and sometimes it was with the camera sometimes we just did whatever we could to get the footage but truthfully we were trying to be in the moment as well as much as possible and so i think that helps and honestly we got stopped by police twice on our entire trip once was in the cairo train station and he just wanted to help me find the right train and he also said, I'll help you put your luggage away. And he didn't ask for money. He didn't ask for anything. He was just very excited to talk to us. And that was very reassuring. And the second time is at the checkpoints on the way to Siwa. And <laughs> you saw what happened from that. And truthfully, the airport is another big place that YouTubers or, or filmers have trouble. And to be honest, I didn't even open my bag through this second security checkpoint outside of customs because some guy in plain clothes just said he saw my american passport and he just said oh come over here come over here you just go right through here and they were checking somebody else so maybe we both got lucky take this for what it is the american passport went a long way to the police and the officials were very supportive they were very excited we said we were american and and they they were very accommodating to us because of that. And that isn't always the case everywhere. Sometimes it's exactly the opposite. But in Egypt, in my experience, that was the case. And lastly, this doesn't have to do with Sonny because I, I, I think he really was trying to go and film and have a great experience and it was unfortunate. But to some other YouTubers and content creators, you gotta remember fear, drama, <laughs> chaos, this gets views. I mean, this is what the news does on a daily basis. You have to remember that when you're watching these videos. Yes, there is corruption. Yes, there's problems. Yes, there's scammers. But it's also gorgeous and so historical. And the food is amazing and the people are amazing. And you have to go see it for yourself. And I would recommend going with a local person, a local connection, and you know, keeping your head on a swivel. But this is, the, this is our goal. Our goal is to, to get views. Our goal is to get you to watch and be excited about it. And our goal is this, this in a thumbnail. Oh my God. Oh no, it happened to me. Watch out for this guy. Oh my God. <laughs> That's our goal. YouTube is the news, man. It works on the same formula. And just like that, I made it back to my house here in San Diego. And I'm gonna finish this video with a rapid fire round of questions that you guys asked me on Instagram and also on the YouTube community tab. So let's dive right into it. First, where to find a reputable guide. So I use two different companies, Amun Tours, A-M-U-N Tours at the Pyramids and you can contact them directly through their website. And second, I used iEgypt from the Aswan to Luxor Cruise and send them a DM via Instagram 
and tell them I sent you and they'll set you up with pricing and itinerary and all the information that you need. And if either of these companies don't hold up their end of the bargain, please let me know and I'll make sure to keep them in check because I want you guys to have an awesome trip. Number two, visa requirements and COVID testing. What's the deal with that, you guys asked? First, visa requirements. Get a visa directly at the airport in Cairo when you arrive. It's 25 US dollars. There are a bunch of sites that say you can do it online beforehand. Don't mess with it. Make sure you bring cash with you, US dollars. You have to pay in cash, $25, and it's super easy directly before you get into baggage claim. Made it to Cairo. That was a very quick entrance. We got off the plane. You paid $25 in cash to get a visa, then take the visa into customs. Customs puts the, the stamp that you're given into your passport and you go right through. A couple of people asking you for rides, but really not much. Now just waiting on bags. And with COVID testing as of February and March of this year, you do not need a negative COVID test to enter Egypt, but you do have to show proof of vaccination with a QR code from your vaccination. And leaving Egypt, going back into the US and Canada, we did both, Tyler and I both needed a proof of COVID negative test. And for that, we simply just asked at our hotel in Cairo before we left, and they have someone on call they brought in. We paid 800 Egyptian pounds the morning of our flight to get negative COVID tests and everything worked out really well. So I, I suggest that. Next, what do you do about a cell phone? So in order to get an Uber from the airport, you're gonna need cell phone reception. Now, a lot of people have international plans these days, but if you don't, that's okay because there's a bunch of different cell phone carriers directly in the airport after you get out of baggage claim. And they have great deals on plans. I think Tyler got his for like 15 US dollars for something like 50 gigs, more than we needed. And I ended up getting a SIM card later on, but with about the same price, it was like 10, 15 US dollars for 20 to 30 gigs, which was more than enough for the few weeks that we were there. So you're gonna need a local cell phone SIM card and any iPhone now you can just, if you don't know, you know that, right? You can just take your SIM out and put a local one in. I assume you guys know that. Did I really like the food in Egypt that much? And let me tell you, I loved it. Honestly, I loved it. All the street food we had from the desserts to the shawarmas and everything in between, it was delicious. My favorite of all was actually the first two nights in Egypt at El Prince and the Hawaushi spot and the second night with the boys. The Kebda and the Hawaushi, those are my two favorite. And I love the fact that everything is served with pickled veggies and tahini. And also whiskey, of course. How's the taste? Shut up. <laughs> you understand now why it's called whiskey? Look at the nipples. <laughs> and in regards to food poisoning or if I had any problems, I can honestly say that I didn't have one issue the entire time. I do bring Imodium tablets with me just in case, but I'm happy to report that everything was uh, regular on the trip. <laughs> in regards to language, it does help a ton to pick up a little bit of Arabic before you go. Very basic words like shokran, habibi, actually habibi for everything. If you have any trouble, Say habibi. 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 Also la, which just means no. And another word to learn is halas. So you could say la halas, which means no enough whenever you're dealing with people trying to sell you stuff. Tell me about weather. I'd say come in the winter. We went in February and March and it was amazing. December through April is what I would recommend. It's much cooler. And just be aware of when Ramadan is because prices will go up and everything is a little bit off, but I definitely want to go back during Ramadan next time and see the full experience. Next, what would you have done differently? And if you had to do everything over again, what would you, what would you change? Anything? I'd fire my tour guide and uh, <laughs> did it myself. I still would have done Siwa because that was an adventure, but really just more places. And I'll talk about that in a second. The other thing is I wish I had more time around Aswan and had a real experience at the Nubian village that was very on the surface, but it would have been cool to meet a, an actual Nubian and, and learn more in depth about their culture. And also I wish I would have spent a night at Abu Simbel at one of the guest houses around there to get to the temple 
super late at night or really early in the morning. And that would have been just beautiful to have the whole place peaceful to ourselves before all of the crowds get there. Cause it's a beautiful, beautiful temple, but there's a ton of people there. What were your expectations versus the reality? So I was expecting to be on edge the whole time. I was expecting not to feel safe. I was expecting more Latin America where you have to be aware of your surroundings, the motorcycles roll up and you should be very, very cautious and late at night and all these things. As far as safety goes, we truly did feel very safe all the time. And I was expecting to feel uncomfortable in a lot of situations because there was just guys coming up to us all the time asking us questions and some pretty shady looking characters at times. But versus, let's say, certain areas in Argentina, Colombia, Brazil, where I've been and lived, I felt comfortable, you know, guys would walk up and you, you gotta give that, you know, that long-term traveler mentality. You're a little paranoid at first and what does this guy want? And it was always fun. And if anything, it was just trying to sell you something or trying to direct you somewhere and just like, nah, I'm good, man. And there was no problems ever. And the last and final question I feel that's fitting to cover here is what's next would you ever return to Egypt? And my answer is without a doubt, absolutely. So I wanna hit Alexandria, I wanna hit Sharm El Sheikh, I wanna hit Dahab, I wanna hit the North Coast in the summertime. There are so many more places that we didn't hit in Egypt that I really want to experience. Even in Cairo, we went to New Cairo a couple of days, but didn't really film there. And you saw a lot of old Cairo, a lot of the old dishes, the street food, the culture, because that's what we were really interested in. But there's a whole modern side to Egypt that I didn't really showcase in this series that I would love to go back and film. The plans are already in motion, so be sure to stay tuned for that. And with that being said, that's a wrap on the Egypt series. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We're actually planning a trip to Croatia at the moment, so stay tuned for that. A few videos from back here in California around my home. But honestly, thank you guys so much for tuning in to the Egypt series. I hope this video was helpful. If you guys did like it, as always, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that notifications bell. Leave a comment. Any other questions you have about Egypt, I will be happy to answer them in the comments. And anybody else that has good information, make sure to tune in as well. So I appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. And as always, travel deeper. Habibi.